those five reflections we chanted just now. For subject to aging, illness, and death, separation. Yet we have a karma as our refuge. Actually, that's only part of the contemplation that the Buddha recommended. He said to go on and think about the fact that all beings, men, women, children, lay or ordain past, future, no matter what their level of being, are subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death, separation. They have karma as their refuge. The two sides of the contemplation are meant to lead to two different reactions. The one we chanted just now, that's to make you realize that you've got to get your act in order, straighten out your life. Because what you do is what makes all the difference in the world. The second side of the recollection, though, is to give you more of a sense of sangwega, sense of dismay over the nature of the human condition. To expand your perspective. One, to look for a way out, and also to get a larger sense of compassion, realizing that everybody is subject to these same problems. This gets you thinking in terms of the, the sublime abidings of the Brahma Viharas, limitless goodwill, not just for your your friends and family, but for everybody, because everybody is subject to these same problems. Limitless compassion, appreciation, limitless equanimity. It's not just we're subject to aging, illness, and death. The Thai translation of this passage is interesting. It says, aging is normal, illness is normal, death is normal. Separation is normal. We forget about that. So it's good to expand your perspective to realize how normal these things are. There's that story of the woman whose child died, and she couldn't accept the fact that it was dead. She went around asking people for medicine for her sick child. So people sent her to the Buddha, and the Buddha said, okay, it would be possible to make a medicine for your child, but it has to be made out of mustard seeds. Well, mustard seeds are easy. It was the cheapest thing you can find in India. But, he said, it has to be from a mustard seed from a family where there's never been a death. So she goes from house to house to house, asks for mustard seed. Everybody's willing to give her mustard seed, but when she adds, adds the condition, is, oh no, we've had a death. We've, my mother's died, father's died, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, children. And after a while it hit home. Her child was dead. She was willing to accept it, because she realized this was a normal part of the human condition. Now, if we had a decent education system, it would teach us how to deal with aging, illness, and death. But we don't have much training in that. Our education system is designed to make us producers and consumers. And the skills we develop in that direction are not necessarily good for the mind and not necessarily helpful for dealing with aging, illness, and death when they come. This is where the Buddha is training. That's what his training is all about. You go to a monastery in Thailand, that's the first thing you hear. We're all subject to aging, illness, and death. And the lesson is how to learn not to suffer in the face of these things. We're all subject to separation. How do we suffer in the face of that? How do we not suffer in the face of that? That's the real issue. And 
the teaching on equanimity is important. It's the one of the Brahma Viharas that helps keep the other ones from causing us to suffer. We want all living beings to be happy. And we see that there's some that are suffering and that we want to help them. Sometimes we can, but many times we can't. That's where equanimity has to come in. Put your mind in a larger frame of reference that we're all subject to our actions. So the question is, what can you do? And equanimity does not teach there's nothing you can do. It just points out the areas where you can't do anything, so you can focus on the areas where you can, where you can be of help. It's basically the reality principle. Notice in the statements for the four Brahma Viharas, the first three start out, may all beings be happy, may they not be deprived, may they be released from stress and suffering. It's the may, may, may. It's a wish. But equanimity is the reality principle. All beings are the owners of their actions. There's no may in there at all. It's just a statement of what is. So you take that as your foundation for then looking, okay, where can you be of help? both in terms of your own suffering and the suffering of other people. And then you can act accordingly, and that's when you can be, be helpful. And one of the principles of equanimity is to just Accept the fact, okay, aging, illness, and death, separation, these are normal. The question is how not to suffer. That's what you can do something about. You know the old story about the man shot with one arrow and then shoots himself with another arrow. The first arrow is the suffering that comes with part of the, the way we live, the nature of having a body, of having a mind. These things are in constant stressful, not self. That's the first error, when pain comes up. But then there's that second error, and it's not just another error. Many times it's hundreds of arrows that we shoot ourselves with as we get all wound up around the suffering. Those are not necessary. And it turns out that those are the ones that really cause suffering, really cause a big burden to the mind. If we didn't have those other arrows, just the first error itself would not reach the mind. It's our misunderstandings. It's our tendency to get all upset around the suffering. Those are the ones that really hurt, based on craving and ignorance. So those are the ones we want to learn how not to shoot ourselves with, because when we stop shooting ourselves with those, then there's no pain, there's no suffering at all. So you have to sit down and face the fact of aging, illness, and death. Okay, These things are inevitable, so what do you do? The Buddha says there are four reasons why death scares us, has us in fear. One is attachment to the body. Second is attachment to sensual pleasures. Third is the knowledge that we've done cruel and horrible things to other people, other beings, and the fear that after death we're going to be punished for it. And then the fourth is not having seen the true dharma having doubts about the true dharma. Now, if we can learn to overcome these four causes of death, death won't bring suffering. And it's only when we've got a handle on these things that we can really be helpful to other people. Now, this doesn't mean that you've totally overcome the fear, but if you learn to deal with your fear of death, so that it doesn't freak you out, then you can help other people as they approach death, too. So this is why it's not a selfish training. It really does put you in a better position to be of help. If you've sorted through your attachments to the body, sorted through your attachments to sensual pleasures, learn to focus on the positive things that you've done. realizing that punishment for the bad things is not necessarily inevitable. 
even better if you get it, gain vision, you know, what they call the Dharma eye, vision of the true Dharma. You can totally overcome your fear of death, and then you can really be helpful to other people. But this doesn't mean you have to wait until that point. Take this issue of being afraid of the harmful things you've done in the past. The Buddha says it's not inevitable you're going to have to suffer from them. He gives the analogy of a crystal of salt. So you've got a crystal of salt in the size of your fist. You put it into a glass of water. You can't drink the water. It's much too salty. But if you find a large, clean river and throw the crystal of salt into the river, you can still drink the water because it gets the salt gets so diluted by the quantity of the water. That's an analogy for the mind with, that's developed the four Brahma-viharas. You develop this limitless quality of the mind, and the mind becomes very expansive. And it's the nature of such a mind that the results of past bad actions just don't touch it as at least don't have such an impact. They don't impinge on the mind as much. So this is one very good reason to develop these qualities of mind. So when the res results of past actions, past bad actions come, they don't hit you so hard. And you can train other people then in the same t with the same skill. get them to develop this larger, more compassionate, more equanimous state of mind. This can begin by reminding them of their generosity, the things, the good things they've done for other people in the past. The bad things they've avoided. These are forms of generosity. These are forms of compassion and goodwill. Because they open up the mind and make it more expansive. When the mind is in a more expansive state like that, the amount of suffering grows less. So it's good to develop these qualities in the mind. One way of developing them is learning how to develop the same attitudes towards your breathing. Have goodwill towards your breathing, compassion, appreciation, equanimity towards your breathing. In other words, allow the breath to be comfortable so you can have a foundation. Where it's not comfortable, work at making it more comfortable. That's compassion. Where it is comfortable, appreciate it. Sometimes, especially in the very beginning, the states of comfort seem to be very minor and not impressive at all. But that doesn't mean they don't have the potential to be more impressive. You've got to give them a little space. It's like oak trees when they first come out. They're pretty small, a little tiny acorn, or even better, coastal redwoods, and the tiniest little seeds. And yet the tallest trees on earth come from these tiny, tiny seeds. Develop the conditions, allow them to grow, and they become a huge forest. It's the same with the sense of well-being in the bodies. First, find areas that are simply not in pain, that seem okay, that's good enough. And then just be very careful to keep them okay. Don't let the way you breathe push them or pull them or squeeze them or anything. Just let them be all right continuously all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out-breath, and they begin to grow. They develop a sense of fullness. And then you can allow that sense of fullness to expand through whatever parts of the body pick it up. Ask for equanimity when there are areas that you can't improve. Okay, develop equanimity for those. Focus instead on the areas where you can make a difference. Don't get worked up over the things you can't improve, because that gets in the way of seeing like, where can you make a difference, where can you be of help.
once you get practice in dealing with the breath in your own body in this way, then it's a lot easier to develop these attitudes towards other people, because you've got a sense of well-being inside. You realize that no matter how bad things get outside, you've still got a place where you can go. And from that position, you can, you can see more clearly, and you have the strength to be of help where you can. So reflecting on the nature of the world, trying to develop these qualities, partly as your own protection, so you don't have to suffer more than is necessary, and secondly, so you can help other people. You put yourself in a better position to be of help. Because you're coming from a position of strength and well-being. This is just one of the most basic lessons you need in what would be a decent education, learning how to deal with aging, illness, death, and separation. Unfortunately, even though they don't give us much of an education like this in school, we can educate ourselves. <laughs>